back with another episode. I have my man here, uh, Matthew Manning. He was so gracious to bless me with his time, his energy, and his insight. I'm sure that you guys are, are watching on YouTube. You are listening on Spotify, Apple. Uh, you know, put on your seatbelts uh, because this is going to be a, a packed show. I uh, definitely want to give him a, a shout out for all of the work that he's doing with Gumbo Media, uh, his motivation uh, career, his mo- motivational speaking career has been uh, great. Uh, so I would like to welcome to the show co-founder, creative director of Gumbo, Matthew Manning. Welcome to the show. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, so let, let's dive right into it. How was early childhood for you? Yeah, I mean, it's a complex question for me because I'm an immigrant to this country. So early childhood was kind of split between uh, a European reality and an American reality. I was born in Stockholm in Sweden. Um, my mom was I'm biracial, um, so she's of Swedish ancestry, and she was really connected with her grandfather growing up, who was a Swedish immigrant, or great-grandfather was a Swedish immigrant, but her grandfather spoke mostly only Swedish. And my father was a singer born in Virginia, so both American-born parents, but found his way to Europe as a singer and was touring as an artist. And so they met there while my mom was studying abroad and while my father was performing and um, ended up having three kids. I was the first. And so I grew up there. They stayed there for 20 years. Um, and my sweetest childhood was beautiful. You know, I had a very diverse uh, kind of group of friends. We were from all over the place, all over the world, really, um, mostly first-generation Swedes. And so that was really interesting. And then when I moved to the United States, which was in Minneapolis, it was a beautiful place. And I had a really good, good group of friends there as well. The American reality was a little bit more harsh. And so there were a lot of things that, you know, I dealt with as a kid, both in my family, and just in kind of society that uh, I reflect on now. I think at the time I was probably a little bit woe is me about. But now, you know, those are things that I think have sharpened my, my toolkit as just somebody who works really hard and understands what it takes to, you know, to get things done and is always willing to learn uh, and to figure out the solutions. And so I think that's, that's where a lot of my entrepreneurial spirit came from. So all in all, it was a very joyful, playful, happy childhood. Uh, there were, you know, plenty of challenges, a few traumas, you know, like, like for us all, but, um, but those things have all helped me become the person I am today. So. That's awesome, man. I, I love to hear. I want to like pause here for a second. Uh, to hear about your your early childhood. Did, did your parents foster arts? You said your dad was a jazz singer. So how was mom uh, being supportive as well? Yeah, they, they definitely, I think, cultivated a, a home where arts were deeply appreciated. Um, yeah, my father was a jazz, blues, soul, gospel, funk singer, any any kind of music that in the spirit of, of Black music traditions, which really is all music, uh, he did. Um, and so I grew up, you know, singing and wanting to play instruments and just immersed in music. I mean, my parents tell me stories about how, you know, I was, I was a pretty quiet kid apparently, but you know, the few times I would cry, they would put on like the whinings or, you know, some old like gospel group. And I would just, you know, I would just go quiet and I would enjoy it. And so like music, even at like age one was my way of, you know, it was a way of kind of contenting my spirit, which was great. Um, and then my mom was, was always, you know, mad supportive. I've always been an artistic kid when I grew up. I mean, I started drawing, I started playing with Legos when I was like super young and I would build at eight years old, I would build like entire airplanes just from memory, right? Like houses and entire villages. I wasn't, you know, building sets so much. I was buying sets to get interesting pieces and would assemble my own things. And so I wanted to be an architect from a really young age. Um, and because of that, I really fell in love with art, um, visual art. And so I was a visual artist growing up. Um, I was always excelling in my art classes. You know, I was I was always kind of one of the best at drawing and things like that. And so I was just a really, really, really right brained thinker. And it took a long time for me to later develop my kind of my left brain business thinking. And I'm still working on it. Um, <laughs> but I always approached the world from kind of a visual language. And I think what I appreciate the most about my parents was one, my father, he had that same skill set. He wasn't very book smart, but he was really street smart. He was really creatively smart, if not a creative genius. And and my mother was just always really nurturing and supportive of that. And she had similar passions growing up, music, art, things of that nature. So she she encouraged me to lean into it. You know, she would do, she does things like even a couple of years ago, buying me a paint set, even though I haven't painted in all the, you know, 20 years, she's still cultivating and nurturing kind of that side of me. And I think it, it gave me permission to explore freely 
who I am as an artist, which I think is what makes me different as an entrepreneur today, right? Um, is the fact that I think from a different perspective and I'm not afraid of approaching life and business from those perspectives. Shout out to your pops for the whinings. Uh, I grew up on the whinings yeah. too. And from the yeah. same type of background, my dad yeah. loves jazz. He put me on to jazz. I listen to jazz on a regular yes, basis. Sir. We go to concerts, things of that nature. So uh, shout it. out to your parents, man. They did a great job. Um, so, so then we're going to uh, skip forward to, um, your, your college education, right? Like, mm -hmm. no, let's go back to high school. How was your art experience, uh, in uh, high school? It was good. I was at, um, a school called Southwest in Minneapolis, which is a public school. It's always kind of charting in the top 50, hundred public schools in the country. So it was like a very good public school to the point where it's almost bordering like a private school education. Um, part of that I think is, um, is funding a lot of it is privilege right um it's a very very white school um and i was kind of a token right like i was one of the few black kids i remember having this very clear moment which i'm writing about actively in some of my work but in i think third grade i which was the first full year of school in the united states it was a very diverse school the school i went to um obviously elementary school was called fulton academy um, and they changed the busing districts over the summer. I had no idea what that meant. You know, I was I was a new American. I didn't really even understand the concept of race yet, because um, it's not to say that there isn't racism or race in uh, Sweden. Of course, there is, but it's a different type of dynamic. It's a different type of discourse, especially that early on. And fourth grade, I realized what changing the busing busing districts meant, because it meant all of the black and brown people were suddenly gone. And so I remember walking in feeling like, oh, I was part of this very diverse cluster of people that I loved, and now I'm walking in and I'm the only person or one of two people that look like me in the entire hallway, in the entire floor, right? Um, and so just feeling that shift in my reality, I carried that all the way through high school. Um, and so I, I think there was a lot of kind of cognitive dissonance. I always um, tried to kind of, um, I think I was trying to figure out who I was, but also kind of uh, ignoring who I was in some capacities because it meant dealing with a lot of, you know, kind of bitter realities about race and privilege and things of that nature. Um, but I think, you know, artistically, I felt that in a similar way in the sense that high school, it was an IB program, International Baccalaureate. It was a lot of uh, AP studies, um, advanced placement, I think it is, I don't remember. But so it was a lot of like really um, high level education, which was great for me. Um, in terms of preparing me for college and stuff, but it was very technical in many cases. Uh, in at times it was a bit critical, you know, um, critical thinking and things of that nature, but a lot of it was very technical. So it was very left-brained. And so there were times where I really struggled, right? I mean, as an immigrant, I didn't speak English fluently until fourth grade. So things like standardized testing because of my right brain thinking, because I, you know, process language differently than a lot of other people like noun and verb placement are opposite in Swedish. And so the way that I naturally think about a phrase in a sentence might be different than a lot of my friends. Those things made things like standardized testing for me difficult to the point where, you know, I kind of thought I was dumb for a lot of school, um, you know, because I just, I couldn't, despite my best efforts, I couldn't do things as well. I, I hit a wall in English. I hit a wall in math. I hit a wall in all these things that I just, I couldn't get past. I think some of that was dealing with the, the trials of home. But the moment that really did it for me, and I think changed my entire trajectory as a career, especially with my passion for architecture, was I remember I was in a history class. I think it was IB, AP, HL, so higher level two uh, history. So it was like the highest level I could right. be in in history. And we were learning history and it was great. You know, it was fine. I love my professors as a dual or teachers as a dual teacher class. And then one day they brought in a art history professor or art history teacher. And he was actually one of my art teachers from earlier on in my high school path. And he came in and he did the entire curriculum that we had done the last, I don't know, four or five weeks in one seminar and did it through an art historical lens. And I remember suddenly all of these things that I've been learning for four or five weeks just started clicking. And I just right. understood it in a different way. And it was one of those moments where I was like, oh, you can blend these things. You can bl blend the, re the left brain and the right brain. I can take a historical or uh, an artistic approach to history or to math or to English or to whatever these studies might be. And so I think that was one of the defining moments for me, so much 
uh, so much to the point where I ended up being an art history major in college just a few months later at DePaul University in Chicago. And so um, that had a big impact on me. And I think I did do his, uh, you know, art classes and stuff like that in, in high school as well, but a lot of that was earlier on. And so I do think that part of me was stifled a bit until that kind of moment of clarity clicked, let, let, you know, in my last few months at school. So uh, I was grateful for that for sure. Let's talk about DePaul. Like, what was your experience like at DePaul? Like, you know, and the second question would be like, did you get a mentor or mentors while you were there? And do you still have them to this day? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, DePaul was great. I love DePaul. I think DePaul was really where I found my stride as a critical thinker, as a leader, as a servant leader, as a designer, frankly, as an artist, um, but also found my community, uh, specifically in black community. Um, it was something that I had to choose. It was something that I had to explore for myself because I'd been limited from that. I mean, I have obviously a black father. I have black siblings. I, you know, had plenty of um, black friends growing up and all of that. But I think learning to kind of find my tribe and find my community was something that I had to decide for myself and something that to me just resonated at, on a whole different level and allowed me to unlock a part of myself that I felt had been kind of stifled because I had been a token almost my entire life. And so um, that was, I think, the most beautiful part of that experience. And I'm forgetting the first, the, the second part of that question. I'm sorry. Well, well, I'm asking about your mentors uh, along that. Oh, yeah, that yeah. Journey. Yeah, and so part of that journey was being a mentor in a program called Men of Color. Mm -hmm. And so, there was a guy named Frankie Valencia on DePaul University campus. He was, I think, a junior, maybe a senior. I was a, a freshman. And I would see him in the hallways. You know, we, you know, we were kind of buddy-buddy. He would, you know, we'd always say, what's up, always dap each other up. And he kept telling me, you should come out to this program. It's called Men of Color Initiative. I think you'd really like it. And I wasn't so sure. I mean, I think, you know, the young, the young arrogance and pride in me was, like, refusing the, the thought that I could use mentorship or that I would benefit from guidance and mentorship. You know, I saw probably, I probably saw myself as a young leader, as the mentor more than I did the mentee, even though it wasn't about that. And even though I could have used it. And um, I finally saw him one day uh, in the office that I went to is the, I think the diversity office or whatever it was. Uh, and that's the program. That's where the program was held from. And he walked in and he was like, no, I'm serious. I want you to come out uh, and I want you to, to show up. Uh, and I said, okay, I got you. Um, and a couple of weeks later on Halloween, he actually was shot and killed, um, oh, in Chicago. Um, I didn't know him well, uh, but I knew him enough and he had had a big enough impression on me and I kind of made this promise to him that I would go. And so I decided to, to show up and to go. And so a couple of weeks later I did go, uh, and I met somebody who I believe was kind of a mentor for me through those years. And, and some of the years shortly after college, uh, his name was Eric Mata. Um, he ran the program. Um, and I met other people like Andre Bob and Andrew and a few other folks who were, uh, super dope to me and kind of mentors and guidances for me throughout. And just to have that safe space where black and brown people just chopping it up and having conversations and discourse about what it means to be a man of color about, um, the things that we were feeling and to have a vulnerable space, but also, um, you know, a strong space and an accountable space of people that cared for you, nurtured you, held you accountable to the things you wanted to do, held you accountable to the things you were doing wrong, I think was really powerful and, and instrumental for me. And so I was a mentee in that program for, um, I think, a year, maybe two. And then I became a mentor for the rest of the, the time that I was in that program. And so as a mentor, as a peer mentor, I would have a couple of mentees. Uh, I think we each had a list of about eight to 10 and we would set up meetings and just be around campus and meet up for a second, you know, over, you know, quesadillas over lunch or whatever it was and, and just chop it up and, uh, and be there for them and help can make, you know, connect the dots. And, and so to feel that happen for me and then to be able to do that for others, I think was really instrumental. And Eric Mata was, um, I think probably my biggest mentor during that time. There were a few others. I was in, you know, gospel choir. And I was in an acapella group. I was in a lot of leadership circles and, you know, leader of Let's go. You got some love? And stuff. Yeah, some. Got a little bit from my dad. I haven't sung in a while. But, um, but so because of that, I, you know, I had other mentors kind of in a more pure capacity in other places. But Eric definitely had a foundational 
impression on me. And I remember one moment specifically that I still think about. He really changed the way I thought about masculinity and the impact masculinity has on the world. And so one of the things that he talked about was, you know, we, this is when we started noticing, you know, the, the killings and kind of these slayings of black and brown bodies increasing, um, or at least the visibility of them increasing because of technology, um, where we noticed uh, conversations on, um, you know, accessibility rights and, uh, and other forms of human rights increasing and all sorts of other things political conversations and discourse were increasing. I mean, again, this is the rise of like Twitter and Facebook and all these things. So everything was just feeling more in your face every day. And the uh, school shootings was another one. And I remember Eric saying one thing that we never talk about, and at the time it was true, is that all of the people who are perpetrating these violent acts are men. We always talk about race. We always talk about mental health. We always talk about all these different things. We never talk about the fact that it's not women going out here and doing these things at least yeah. the vast majority of the time, right? 99% of the time. And what does that say about the conversation gap around masculinity, uh, around the conversation gap around mentorship and guidance and all of these things that we could really provide for each other um, to have safer spaces? What does that say about the lack of opportunity we feel uh, we feel we have to talk about the things that are you know, ailing us um, and, and that result in other things? And that's not to say that you know, a lack of space provided by others is the culprit for, you know, it's not to put any kind of outer excuse for uh, accountability. Accountability needs to happen regardless. But it made me think about and elevate masculinity as one of the first conversations that we needed to have in every conversation and in every discourse I was engaged with, you know, and at the time I was writing a lot about race. I was writing a lot about um, religion. I grew up in a religious household um, and uh, I'm not as religious uh, these days. Uh, I'm much more of just kind of a spiritual uh, and energy driven person, but these became intersections for me, right? And they dovetailed with conversations on, on masculinity. And so that was that was a key mentor for me who really shaped the way I, I see the world even today. Man, that's so impactful, man. And, uh, you know, those are one in a lifetime type of, um, you know, situations with mentors, right? I, I have mentored myself yeah. that I still, from high school, that I, I share that same sentiment. Um, so you, you do a lot of great work. I see the, the worldwide orphanage, uh, relief correlation. You did, I speak yeah. in Chicago or I speak mm -hmm. Chicago. Can we briefly talk about those things? Yeah. So as a freshman in college, I think it was like October 14th, something like that. Um, I dealt with trying to find the easiest way to talk about this. I dealt with a lot of mental health issues growing up because of some of the things that I was enduring in Minneapolis. And uh, because of that, by the time I got to college, I'd already been depressed for, you know, seven, eight years, like a big chunk of my childhood. Um, my father was, was a bit more absent than I would have liked for him to have been earlier on. Um, you know, just be rebuilding that friendship over the last few years, frankly. Um, there were a lot of things at home. I was working full time as a student, which is, you know, basically illegal, but, but I had to, in order to help cover the bills and help support my mom, um, I was helping to raise my sisters. And so all of these were weights that I was feeling and I was suppressing what I was feeling until I got into college really. And the one thing that made me feel good was service was giving back to others. And so by the time I got to college and I was on my own and I didn't have as many of the familial pressures as many, I still had them in some capacities. I got involved in all the student organizations, too many, frankly, to the point where I got too busy and I was now, you know, just like burying myself and hiding from, you know, truths by burying myself in service. But it was the one thing that like eased, I, I got these physical like pains and contractions in my stomach, which was physical pain from mental and emotional strain. And, um, and the only time that they subsided was when I was like smiling and laughing with other people in some kind of a service capacity. And um, I took a trip that I, I raised uh, raised up for for a couple of years by doing um, doing events and uh, fundraisers and stuff at our school. I asked to rent the school space. Well, we have given the school space for free in the auditorium, and I would have people come out and do a talent show, and people would pay tickets. And I did that for a couple of years to raise enough money to then go to Ghana, and I got some additional support right after three days after my graduation. And this is right when I'm kind of reckoning with my with my depression. And so I go to Ghana 
I um, have an amazing experience there. I work in an orphanage in a, a kind of a northeastern remote part of Ghana called Nkwanta, uh, which is in the Lake Volta region. And I worked there for six, six or seven weeks. I mean, I'm there for the entire summer before college to the point where my roommate for college is like, where is this guy? And does he not <laughs> like me? Like, why have I not heard from him? Um, I just completely forgot about all things America. But it was, it was the freest I'd ever felt. Um, it was the, the happiest I felt, frankly, in like a decade. Um, and so I thought about what, like, what is it about this that, you know, that is important to me, but also, um, these kids who comparatively, you know, here I am kind of woe is me and these kids comparatively, and it's not a comparison, but, you know, just to, to lean into that for a second, they have nothing compared to me. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet they are as happy as can be. Um, and they couldn't be any more kind of, um, well, they, they are, they're knowingly um, choosing to choose happiness, despite, the, you know, what they're, what they see around them. And in some cases, I don't think they know what they don't have. Right. right. Um, and so for me, that was a difficult thing to kind of grapple with because it doesn't necessarily get easier when you get home. You still have to reckon with the lack of happiness you have, but now you also are aware of the fact that you should have more happiness because these kids that halfway around the world have it and you don't, and you have everything that they wish they had. Right. And so I'm, I'm kind of, racking my mind around that. And so when I get to college, I lean into service organizations and all of that. I end up starting a nonprofit organization completely naively. I did it as a freshman. Um, you know, I filled out an application online. I was doing that on a Wednesday night instead of doing my homework. I remember being up to like two or three in the morning, a few late days later in the mail, I get this, you know, this uh, kind of notice the articles of incorporation that say, Hey, you know, here's, here's your organization. And I start leading that for a few years. Initially, it's kind of volunteer based, which I eventually canceled because it ended up feeling too much for a lot of folks. Like it was kind of volunteerism. You know, it's another resume check mark. And like for me, that was never a consideration. I just want to go and be present and serve. Um, but it's a very Americanized way of thinking about it. It's a very, very Westernized way of thinking about it. You know, it makes us feel good to go and serve other people who don't have as much. It's not actually benefiting them in any real way because it's, it's only done through a charitable lens. And so I started thinking more about. Uh, sustainability lens. And that's when over, over about course of, you know, five, six years, the organization evolved and it eventually started doing some really good work in Uganda, Rwanda, um, and uh, Sierra Leone, and in some cases, Ghana. And what we did was sustainable small business development. So we would invest in a lot of the small business practices that we saw, and we would use our connections to the global economy to basically help increase their yields and help increase the productivity so that they could have more money to make for themselves. But it was them investing in their own businesses as opposed to us just coming here to serve. Right. Um, and so that's kind of what it became. Be beekeeping practices, tree nurseries, piggeries, stuff like that. Uh, we would basically say, Hey, what do you need? Okay. Let us go back, fetch a lot of these resources and come back, give you these things. And now they could increase their yields four times, you know, what they, what they were, stuff like that. So that's kind of what, where that became. And then I speak was, um, was kind of a coalition in Chicago of folks coming together to change news cycles. This is, again, the height of kind of 24-hour news cycles and Twitter and stuff like that. And Chicago was and continues to be picked on all the time, unnecessarily and unfairly so, un inaccurately so, for its violence, right? And so I Speak was our attempt to bring people together to kind of shift and provide another way of sharing news and sharing, um, you know, messaging around Chicago that was positive and that was highlighting kind of the art scene and the positivity scenes and things like that that were happening in the city. I will say though, both of those were very kind of naive and were us as a lot of privileged individuals stepping in into situations that were far more complex than we understood and into situations that we didn't have proper context for. And so evolved my way out of both of them, but I'm very and eternally grateful for um, the experience that I got in both because they made me, I think, part of the leader that I am today and informed leadership from kind of an international relief aid perspective, from a local, you know, news perspective and a local um, kind of con context uh, in terms of what we know, what we don't know, the privileges we hold, things of that nature. And there's lots more stories there, but for sake of time, I'll defer those to a different day. Wow. Amazing. Um, so I definitely want to, and that, that it, it seems like it's a, it's a, it's a story, right? It's a story mm -hmm. that you're taking me on the story and that makes sense. And we're going to, we're getting to gumbo media, right? Like I've, I've done a little research 
The website looks amazing. You guys have so many things. I just want to start with the gumbo media part. Like what is the primary function and how do you go about recruiting your team members? Um, They seem like they have a lot of experience. Yeah, so Gumbo Media kind of emerged from what we call a deficit or gap. It was 2016. This is kind of a 48-hour span where Alton Sterling and Philando Castile were both uh, killed. Um, I'm from Minneapolis, and Philando was just, you know, miles away from kind of where I grew up. Um, and so just feeling those two very heavily, obviously also on the heels of Trayvon Martin and, and um, you know, the, the many, many others. and. And I just felt my my perspective and my lens shifting. I think we were, I was doing a lot of consulting, brand consulting. So you think about my kind of architecture experience growing up, you think about my graphic design, you think about my copywriting and my writing that I was starting to do. All of those things kind of culminated into consulting, right? I could help others better polish and tell their stories because I had the skill set visually and narratively to help them make those things shine, but also strategically because of my nonprofit experience as kind of a young, naive entrepreneur. And so that's where it kind of blended itself to. But I found myself committing a lot of time to institutions that didn't seem to care about diversity and equity, uh, both in terms of the teams that I was a part of, as well as in terms of the the clients that we served. Uh, The teams that I was part of, a lot of them claimed they did, but it didn't feel like they ever worked hard enough to actually make it a reality, right? You you can talk the talk, but how do you actually walk the walk? Um, And so, when those, uh, when that happened in July of 2016, I think I was at a place where I was like, my tides are shifting. I'm sick of pouring all of my energy and time into uh, all of these different places uh, and all of us doing that at the same time. Like what happens if we all come together and mobilize those efforts? And um, my partner and I, she's my business partner and also my life partner, um, we went to a uh, wedding and it was kind of a brief moment of levity in the midst of all that grief, right? And we were talking about a magazine that we'd been wanting to start because we love magazines, we love coffee table books, stuff like that. And we kind of posed the idea and we decided, we were thinking about it as like a five-year plan and we decided why not, you know, I think it was her, her name is Courtney. She said, why not do it now? So we're like, okay, yeah, let's do it now. And as we started thinking about it and talking about it, we realized that what, what we needed and wanted to do was actually to build kind of a media, media ecosystem. So it wasn't just about a publication. It was about meeting people where they're at. Not everybody reads a magazine. Not everybody listens to a podcast. Not everybody's on social, but everybody engages in some way with storytelling, right? How can we build an ecosystem that allows us to meet people where they're at and use that ecosystem not to amplify celebrity stories, because those are the same three, 400 stories we hear in the cycle over and over and over again, and not to perpetuate you know, stereotypes about our communities that are like the Fox News cycle, right? Because that's that's what I speak and a lot of those, those initiatives are for. But how do we go into the middle? Those 46 million, and might probably more now, you know, black Americans that live in this country that are everyday people and deserve to see themselves as an everyday person reflected with more complexity and more nuance. And so we built, um, we built an organization around that or a company around that and around that effort. It started around community, um, and so a lot of events and programs, stuff like that, panel discussions, you know, uh, kickbacks, you know, happy hours, whatever, just come together, vibe, chill, learn about each other, build. Um, we did a lot of content. So we had uh, original storytelling series. We were doing digital video production, stuff like that. And then we had services, which I was just doing as the brand consultant and me, I'd been doing this stuff. So this is a way that we can pay the bills uh, for the business, you know, a lim- nimble, lean operation. And then when COVID happened, we couldn't do the community stuff as much anymore. And the content stuff didn't make as much sense because it's high cost and it's kind of low yield until you can build up enough eyeballs and impressions that you can then start making money off ad dollars and stuff like that. But we also, you know, don't want to just have kind of traditional capitalist ways of just pulling in ads that don't mean anything to our community. We want to, we want to make sure that that has a purpose too, right? Like black owned brands and stuff that people should know about. Um, And so we really leaned into the services. And that was in 2020. And we fell into a a niche, which is, again, we're seeing kind of this racial reckoning happening with Breonna Taylor and uh, uh, Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. People want to work with black brands um, and they realize their shortcomings in terms of black storytelling and at least inclusive storytelling. 
And so uh, at the same time, it's COVID. People are stuck at home. They're starting to build up their own ideas. They're starting to build up their own businesses. So at the same time, people are looking for a diverse group of, you know, brand consultants and brand consultants that can bring their ideas to life. And we just happen to already be existing and be in that niche. And so kind of unintentionally, we fit a market niche and we just grew and scaled about 2000% over a couple of years. And we went from about 19K in revenue because we had no reason to make more than that. Um, that was just what we, that wasn't ever our focus in 2019 to about 600,000 or 200,000 in 2019 and about 600,000 um, the year after in 2020. And that was very rapid growth. And so that was really exciting for us. And so we just kind of leaned into that. And along the way, I, you know, I just, I'd, I'd been building this large network of creatives just because that was my own world. And so I just would pull friends in and say, Hey, I want to work with you. Would you want to be a part of this? Like, let's, let's pull more energy away from those white institutions and start building up for our own people and for our own communities. And others can be a part of this. Other identities can be a part of this, but they need to honor the fact that this is a black space first. Right. Um, and that's kind of what we've built. And I think over time people have stayed, we get questions about retention a lot. Activation for us has been easy, but retention has also been somewhat easy for us. And I think part of it is because it's us, it's us chopping it up. We're talking about our hair journeys 15 minutes before we start the, the, the strategy, right? We're actually checking in on each other and how we're feeling. We're putting in community care clauses that allow us to honor what it feels like to be a black person trying to work amidst international or you know national trauma in the news cycle, right? All of those things are part of our infrastructure. So it just, it's a space that feels more community. It feels more, uh, you know, kind of familial. And I think that's really how this, the team has built. It's been kind of organic. And right now we have about 40 to 45 contractors. It's a very contract-based team. We're just now taking the turn into kind of W2 employees for operations and, and you know, larger kind of strategy type roles. And then the contract team will be the contract team. And they, they're the ones who execute a lot of the services for clients. So, and now we're coming full circle and bringing back the, the rest of the stuff as well. That's amazing. So are you still hands on with a lot of projects or are you kind of like removed and like more guiding the, the project? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm hands on on select projects more so as a strategist these days. I'm not doing really any design anymore. Every once in a while, you know, people's time lapses or, you know, things just dovetail in a way where it's like, OK, somebody needs to fill this this gap that is emerging. Can somebody offer a few extra design hours? Things like that happen. Um, so every once in a while I'll dive in, but for the most part, I don't really do any design anymore. I don't really do any copywriting anymore, um, outside of my own personal, you know, writer's journey. Um, but in gumbo, I'm more of b building up the operations team, small business development. So I'm building up about six new business ventures within gumbo, the broader umbrella of gumbo this year, so that we can start removing ourselves from kind of all eggs in one basket type of model that we have right now in services. Um, building up teams, culture, stuff like that. Um, and then on projects, I work maybe on one or two projects as opposed to, you know, 11 to 12 in the past. Right. And that's mostly in a strategic capacity. So I obviously tell that you're passionate about it. Um, yeah. It seems like, did you play sports in high school, right? Were you active or? Because I see the, the double. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I was definitely active. I did, um, I did basketball. Um, I wasn't in high school basketball or anything. It was all like church league stuff. I was kept it more recreational, more fun, uh, especially because our high school was, was pretty trash anyway. Um, so I don't <laughs> think it was a lot of fun. There's a lot of work with not a lot of rewards. So um, I did, uh, yeah, I did a lot of college ball, did a lot of intramurals through college. I mean, I'm sorry, high school ball, a lot of intramurals through college, stuff like that. So I've always stayed active. And then I did my first marathon in 2014. Um, year after graduating. And I think I was just at a period where I was just like, I just needed to prove to myself that I could do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't train properly. I didn't really have a community to do that. Um, but I did it and um, struggled through it. And then <laughs> years later, but through that, I found running, right? Running became not like a big passion of mine, but something that I could depend on to get exercise. And uh, it was healing in some ways too. And uh, my partners actually became kind of an avid runner um, while I was away doing some work, she did like a 30 day running challenge and she just, she stuck with it. She's still with it. She's at an, she's at a workout right now. Um, and, um, Nike approached her, uh, we'd already started gumbo. 
uh, for and been doing it for a couple of years. And Nike approached her. They were finding leaders in the community and she kind of naturally risen as a leader. Um, and they decided to kind of invest in her in a way. Um, they didn't like pay her anything, but what they wanted to do was help provide some of the capital and more so more of the in-kind support to be able to start kind of a running initiative on the south side of Chicago, which is where we lived. And there was really a stopgap in the folks that were able in, in communities like that on the south side of Chicago at the time. Now there's not. Now there's a lot on the south and west sides, and I think Gumbo Fit helped kind of bridge that change. So we built an extension of Gumbo Media, which is Gumbo Fit. And wellness had always been kind of a key element of this, and this is more the fitness element of wellness, right? So we built that out. Um, you know, we're told it's going to be tough to start, but you just got to be consistent. As long as you're always showing up, people will show up. And we did. We showed up every Saturday morning for, you know, runs, even when it was really cold outside, even when it was just me and Courtney ended up taking a run by ourselves. Nobody else showed up, right? But eventually people started to come out. Um, we got a couple features in Nike, which helped a lot and really propelled the community. And, um, and now it's, it's a big initiative powered by Nike running and we're working on some really amazing ideas. And anybody wants to check out Gumbo Fit is in Chicago. Once a running community, check that out. Even if you're not in Chicago, you just want inspiration, check that out. It's just Gumbo Fit and Gumbo Media respectively on, on IG. Um, but it's, it's really become its own thing. Like it's just, it's a massive, massive community of runners and fitness enthusiasts who are just coming together to run together, uh, very based in black and brown running and fitness communities. But there's a broad, broad swath of people coming out just to support because they like the vibes, right? Um, holding each other accountable, um, just having fun with each other and, and enjoying this this as a way to, to release and get healthy. Now, will, will you have a Gumbo Fit LA or uh, is that in the cards? Yeah, we're figuring that out. Um, I think Courtney's... When COVID happened, we really had to like burrow deep to like make sure that we could sustain these communities. And so I really became the leader of Gumbo Media and she really became the leader of Gumbo Fit, even though we co-founded both of those together. Um, so she's she's kind of leading that charge. There are some models, I won't, I won't share them yet because they're still very much in the ideation phase um, and you know don't want to overcommit or overpromise anything, but we're, we're working on some really cool ideas for how we're gonna help sustain both of those communities regardless of where you're at. And so there are ways that we're hoping to bring more of a presence to Los Angeles and really all other places. Um, I don't know how much of that presence will be a physical presence. And I think part of that is also not wanting to assume or jump the gun on trying to understand what the needs are in L.A. You know, like we lived in Chicago for a long time. We saw what the gap was and we filled it. Um, we don't want to assume that those gaps are here in L.A. You know, we want to be able to live here for long enough to be able to understand what the gaps are and then figure out if we're the right people to fill those gaps and in what way, uh, as opposed to just jumping in and, and building a new presence, because there are a lot of other running groups out here. So to be determined, we'll see. OK, I'll definitely keep my eyes open. And the, the last thing I want to do as we land this plane is talk about uh, Black Words. How did that come about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so BlackWarriors.co was started. Well, actually, it's funny you mention that because I have a call, I think today or maybe tomorrow morning. Um, we're going to be redeveloping that um, and building it out as a custom site. Um, but we started this part of, I think, the role that we feel like we serve at Gumbo is thinking through, again, what are the gaps that exist and how can we help fill them? And one of the gaps that I realized with my skill set in writing and my experience in writing and you know, obviously my everybody has to write in college, um, but also my intersection in thinking about race and all these different things, masculinity, et cetera. I was doing a lot of searches like, you know, quotes by black authors, <laughs> you know, quotes by black athletes or leaders or whatever. Uh, I mean, even just managing a social media page, you're going to find yourself doing a lot of that if those are the intersections that you're kind of engaged in. And I was like, there really doesn't feel like there's one a one-stop shop to get this content. Um, and that to me began to feel like a gap, but also began to feel like an amazing business opportunity for us to, to build around. And so we basically went through a process of aggregating, um, you know, as many quotes as we can. We only got through, you know, I think like the bees. Um, ugh, there's so many more to do. Um, and then COVID hit and, and focus has kind of shifted because this is kind of all a free, you know, uh, thing that we were committing to it was kind of a volunteer effort. Now we have more of an infrastructure to reinvest in it. So the goal is to kind of flip the platform. It's just blackwords.co. 
Um, but it's a great source for quotes. We do see the traction and people are actually using it still. People have found it, I think, just from, you know, some of the, uh, from either being connected to our uh, platforms or maybe ho hopefully SEO and just searching online, keyword searches, stuff like that. So our goal is to make it like the biggest repository for black quotes in the world um, and to kind of have that up there. So it's really easy for folks to find quotes from Black authors, thought leaders, community builders, um, you know, revolutionaries, whatever it might be, uh, really accessibly. And so we're working on, you'll see a, you'll see a facelift for that by probably October of this year, which is exciting. So, yeah, that's where that can wait. From. I'll definitely uh, tap in. Uh, and is there any last words of any um, upcoming creative or somebody who's in the creative space and they want to make a pivot in a different, you know, uh, space within the creative uh, ecosystem, what words of, a, of advice would you give them? Yeah, I think I would, um, I mean, one, I would encourage people to keep going. I think it's very easy. We don't prioritize creativity enough, especially in kind of business spaces. Uh, I think even in academic spaces, you know, the arts programs and budgets are always the first to be cut. And I think because of that, it's really easy to feel like there's not enough support there are not enough people that care um, and it's really easy to give up. But I think if you're interested in a kind of a creative pursuit um, and hoping to sustain yourself around it, one, be keyed in and tap into what that passion is because the passion is really what's going to get you through those, <laughs> those dark days and months where um, you're second guessing whether or not you should just go back to whatever you were doing before, or, you know, you should find a job to hold you over and all those things. And I think all of those things are realistic things that you should also be, considering and, and be true, fair and true, truthful to yourself about. But the key, I think, for me is not to give up. I think the only reason I've been able to sustain myself now for several years around creative pursuits is because I didn't give up. Um, that's really the only thing that separates me from anybody who um, hasn't been able to sustain that. Um, I'm not any more talented. You know, I just, I, I, I kept going. I sacrificed a lot of my 20s to do that, but now I'm in my early 30s and I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be and I get to enjoy this for the rest of my life. And that's really exciting. Um, keep building and growing in that. So that's part of it. The other thing I would say is just be creative and be unique, like lean into that creativity in terms of how you pursue that field as well. I think we think very linearly at times and literally at times. And I think that's a lot because of how we're educated, which is a very left brain kind of linear way of thinking as opposed to, you know, thinking kind of constructively and creatively in broader terms. And what I mean by that is like, I was an art history student and everybody said, everybody joked all the time, oh, how are you going to use that? You know, all you can do is be an art history professor. And I'm like, work, because I can look at any building and break down all of the influences from all over the world. Like, to me, this is a cultural snapshot of how the world works. How is that not valuable in any field I could possibly choose, right? How does that how does that not make me distinct and unique in terms of how I process the world around me and the businesses around me and, and my approach to them? And I had my entrepreneurial skill set, so I was comfortable in any room. I wasn't intimidated by X, Y, Z person. I didn't care what your resume was. Like, I know I have something to offer this space as well, right? Those things allowed me to kind of feel comfortable in the different rooms that I was entering to pursue things in different ways, to think critically about how I can exist, you know? So instead of, if you're loving music, maybe it's not just the music path. Maybe it's not just the path where it's you purely as an artist. You could also be a producer. You could also work like the music industry is infinite. The film industry is infinite. The artistic industry is infinite. I know friends who were artists who are now curators. You know, I know friends who were artists uh, in music who are now producers or studio managers or, um, you know, help produce stuff for film and television, right? Like there are different ways and different uh, pathways that are different, unique intersections as people can find a home um, in, in that creative field. And so I think, think about your intersections, think about the things that make you unique. For me, it's my multiculturalism. It's, it's the way that I view the world. It's my art history background mixed with, um, you know, the things that I grew up with. And, and those things put me in a position where I was a great brand consultant and I was a great, you know, uh, in a great position to help lead creative teams. Maybe others have different skill sets and different intersections that position them really well for things that they may never have considered before. So I think also just breaking out of the box and allowing other options to show themselves to you as well. In the words of DJ Khaled, another one, 
Uh, another man, one. It's been a pleasure, bro. Uh, connecting Likewise, with you. brother. Uh, you're you're a wealth of knowledge. I feel in the future that we'll we'll probably have to do a part two because it's, it's just so much that I think you have to unpack. Um, to unpack, but uh, where can people find Gumbo uh, Media on social platforms, and how can they tap mm-hmm. in? Yeah, well, first of all, I appreciate it. Uh, absolutely, game for game for uh, V two whenever. Uh, but yeah, people can find Gumbo. Um, the easiest place is online. I mean, it's GumboMedia.com, dot com um, at Gumbo Media on Instagram. Um, Gumbo Fit is on our Gumbo Media website. That's also being flipped. So depending on when people see it, the website will be different soon as well. I think those are probably the easiest places, and you can really be pinpointed anywhere else you need to go within the Gumbo ecosystem from there. Love it. My pleasure, bro. Thank you. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, comment below, and let Matthew know um, your thoughts on this, uh, this podcast.